he's from my, I'm, I'm from a small church in Long Island. Um, it's called the Church of God in, uh, in Freeport. A uh, small church. My pastor is uh, Jesus Villagran and his wife Nina Villagran. Um, good mentors, good, good spiritual leaders. And I want to give thanks to you for having me. Uh, I thought, you know, and um, having him is a pleasure for me. I think that usually when I get my testimony, it's more blessing to me. You know, and I hope that you guys will be graced and get something out of it. Um, I'm also here with my wife. She rarely comes with me. And I, it's always a struggle, but she's here. Um, my little man. My son is sleeping at home. He, uh, you know, took a video game. So, so um, well, my name is Luis Romero, right? And um, uh, before I'm going to just make a quick little prayer first. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, um, I just wanted to thank you for this gathering here, as the pastor said, the call out ones. Um, Lord, allow us to have church uh, without walls, not nothing, no pretense, no nothing, just really a fellowship between brothers and sisters and, and the youth that's here, Lord. And I'm asking you, as I share testimony, Lord, let it not be a bragging moment. Let it be something that whoever's going to hear this may hear from your Holy Spirit as a teacher. Whoever's going to uh, hear this, Father, families are here, fathers, mothers, marriages, Lord. Um, um, we don't know what's going on here, Father. You, you know. You know the struggles of the body. You know the struggles of the pastors, Father. So I lift that up before you in this congregation, Redemption Church. And I want to thank you thus far for what, what was happening here and what's going to continue happening in this church. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and we say an amen, because we know he's going to do it. And we say amen. Um, I'm going to start a little backwards, right? Um, you know, the sister was singing about, you know, um, Jesus breaking the chains, redemption, um, the pastor mentioned the correctional facility, right? So I'm going to let the cat out the bag first. I usually don't do that when I share my testimony. Um, the, about seven years ago, seven years ago, I was sitting in a correctional facility, a maximum security facility called Sullivan in Sullivan County. I just had finished completing 19 and a half years in prison for the crime of murder. And I say that with shame. So I know that today's culture, rappers, and whatever's had Hollywood, they, they highlight murder. And it's not. Murder's not a good thing. We know where that comes from. Um, so I sat in the cell. I was coming home on the, to my third parole where they finally decided, hey, this guy's ready. Um, stepping out of prison, I was already um, born again. I had stayed up with serving the Lord in prison for close to 14 years under leadership. And so one of the things is that you know, um, people would ask me, was it your environment? Was it, well, what made you do it? Right? And, and looking back and looking to what the Word of God says, you know, um, and I'm a little background, I'm, I'm a Bronx kid. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, born in San Jose, right? Big Puerto Rican, no Puerto Rican, de la raíz, as they say. But I was raised in the Bronx. I was raised in the 1980s, Hunts Point. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Hunts Point back in the 80s. Um, you know what that was, right? <laughs> You know, and um, so I was, um, so they asked me, were you a product of, of Hunts Point? Were you the product of, of, the, of the South Bronx? If you would ask me back then before knowing Jesus Christ, I would have said, yeah, you know, this is, this is what it is. You know, this is what, what, what street doesn't matter, this is what we do in the streets, this is how we are, we're BX. Somebody said, Bronx said BX, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm going to read something just real quick. I wrote it down. Um, it's in Proverbs 4.23. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So I'm going to say this, uh, again, based on the word, what the word says, my view experiences, I believe that if it wasn't the South Bronx, it wasn't uh, because I was in, you know, wherever I was at, it was the condition of my heart. It was tainted, it was dirty. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ said another thing about the heart. It says um, in Matthew 15, 19, he said, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, Murders, adulteries, been there. Fornication, been there. Death, been there. False witnessing, I bend it and blasphemies. And I'm going to explain that as we hear my testimony. I'm going to explain all that and put it in a context that they, they, they could be understood. Because I, I think we should speak about these things. Um, so I'm going to say that going back as far as I can remember as a child, um, the biggest thing in my house was domestic violence. You know, a little kid, um, I'm the oldest of actually seven sisters. Um, two of them biological, my dad was a romantic guy, right? So whatever happened, it happened, right? And so I remember that as a kid, you know, it was, uh, I remember the um, partying. There was always um, domestic violence components. Um, again, I love my dad, I, my mom, you know, 
I just didn't know as a kid what was wrong at my house. I didn't understand what was going on. And you know, back then, if I would ask my mom's family, I say, I tell my aunts, uh, she has eight aunts and uh, sisters and three uncles. I would ask them, hey, we're, we're going through this. Different opinions. They would say, you know, they would, uh, some of my sisters were in favor of mom against my dad. And then some of the sisters were against my mom. They would say, hey, maybe your mom is doing something wrong. This is why this is happening. So, you know, as a little kid, you're thinking, wow, you know, where is the solution in this? When I go to my dad's family, they were totally against my mom. So, as a kid growing up, right, as a kid growing up, and seeing what's going on at home, and not having the ability to try to fix it or let, let alone understand it, you know, my heart started getting tainted, right? My started getting hit, there was confusion, there was pain, there were hurts. Um, my dad, being a military guy, we was always thrown from different states. You know, we were sent back to Puerto Rico, we ended up in Germany. And, and again, I felt like a young person, young kid who was trying to swim in deep waters, trying to get to shore, and I was getting fatigued, right? At that time, and this is what I mean about the heart, you know, that the word of God teaches us that the enemy does that. It does that. So as a little child, little by little, the resentment, the hurts, the pain, the anger, the frustration of seeing what was happening at home, there was no solution. Now, I'm going to say this. I knew there was a God, right, back then. I knew there was a God. If you, if you see the composition of my family, they, they, the, the, the major religions they would practice would be Catholicism, Pentecostalism, um, there was um, Brujeria, right? From Puerto Rico, um, Bukumi Religion, Santeria, whatever name. So it was a mixture. So I'm getting all this message from family members, and I'm trying to figure out where, you know, where, where is God in all this? So little child, I didn't see God in what was happening in my family. I didn't see it. Finally, uh, one incident happened. We ended up in Puerto Rico. Finally, my mom and my dad separated. That was very painful for me um, because although the things that were happening at home happened, you still, you know, kids, you love your parents. Your desire is to see mom and dad together in spite of whatever's going on. Amen? That's just that. In the, in the mind of a child, in the mind of a child, you want family together. You're willing to suffer whatever you have to suffer just for that little bit of a family life, that little bit of, 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 of togetherness and, and wholeness, even if it's a false pretense, right? And that was me. So I ended up in Puerto Rico um, with my grandparents. My mom, you know, trying to find out a solution, good Catholic girl that she was, right? She ends up going to this um, guy in the mountains who was into witchcraft, right? And um, so I remember she said, listen, we're gonna, she went to the market and we ended up um, meeting this lady and they said, listen, you, you have problems, speak to this guy, he can help you, right? So we ended up going, uh, a couple of weeks later we go, I think it was like now, I'm not sure. And um, we ended up in the mountains and I was about that time, nine or 10 years old. And we met this guy, you know, he was in the mountain, he did some rituals and stuff like that, some baths for my mom. He blessed him with something, and then he started telling my mom everything was going through, right? And I remember as, as I'm listening to this guy, and he's going in detail what's going on in our lives, I said to the little child, I said, you know what? This has to be God. God is, this is God, because this is the only person, he doesn't know us. We just came from Germany about a couple of months ago. We met the lady in the market. I remember my mom didn't share nothing. She just said this, I'm just going through the voice and I don't know what to do, and then she started crying, and they said, hey, call this guy, this guy's good. So as a little child, I already got into spiritism. I thought that that was God. I started delving into it, I started reading into it, I started practicing whatever I could you know, amass. As a little kid, um, my mom continued to try to fix her marriage, trying to find solutions to problems. And this, is, and this is why the word is so true, that we shouldn't consult wizards and witches and none of that stuff, because what you're tapping into is something that is not of God. And this is what I believe that, that in our faith, there's only one Holy Spirit who was designed, you know, he was designated by Jesus Christ, by the Father, to be a teacher to us. And I'm going to tell you, I serve many spirits. Very confusing, right? You know, that one spirit telling you this, another spirit doing that. I, I ended up, you probably, 20 years ago, in, in uh, Botanical Gardens in the Bronx, probably killing chickens, all type of stuff. That probably was, you know, me in the news, right? You guys didn't know it then, but the spirits, these spirits make you do things that they make you ridiculous, they make you uh, uh, ignorant, they get you further from God. So I'm glad that we have one spirit, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And anything after that, which is angels and stuff, serve us, they protect us, they keep us, and they guide us, amen? amen. Right? And they bow down to God. Because now this is the same thing about the angels and you pray to them and all that stuff. That's, that's not true. Amen. So 
what happened, um, things got a little stabilized after we went to see that man. Um, things got a little better. My mother found uh, another man. Um, I, 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 to me, he was like the best stepfather we had for these two years. And it turned out that one day, that's Carlos, one day, um, Carlos went to Pinones, had a few beers with a friend, and then uh, we didn't know he was, he was uh, on the wagon. He was a drug addict, he was on the wagon, and he started snoring cocaine, he came back. And I remember I was sleeping, I just heard the beatings, my mother was fighting, and um, I remember flashbacks, like, wow, we, what happened here? We were good, right? So we ended up going, from that incident, my mom defended herself, he ended up going to the hospital with gas in his head. Um, but Charlie used to carry a gun. And I remember that at that time we had to leave went to our grandfather's house, we went from house to house for months, and then finally my grandfather said, listen, you need to get out the country. You're, 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 this guy's gonna come kill you. He's coming, he's determined, this is what he wants to do. We ended up coming to Port Chester, New York, and eventually I ended up in the Bronx. Now, in the Bronx, let me, let me tell you something. And this is why my family, so I'm big on families. When I see family units together, my pastor, mother, father, a father's doing their thing and, and, and loving their children and wives and, and vice versa, it brings joy because in the Bronx, I was a young teenager, and, and you think about it, I was raising two of my sisters, right? I was kind of like the pseudo husband to my mom because now my mom is leaning on me to make major decisions for the family. Not a good thing. We ended up in the Bronx, we was poor, uh, we suffered went through against Hunts Point. Uh, Hunts Point, and like I said, you guys didn't know Hunts Point in the 1980s. You know how it was. Every corner was a drug spot. Every, 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 every little um, deli had a little prostitution going on. Uh, I remember my first incidents of gun and violence was in the Bronx, in uh, Seneca Avenue, Hunts Point. We more sat. And so at that time, I developed a little something that Danny put in my heart. And it was that anything bad that would happen to my family from that point on, it was my dad's fault. And nobody told me that. It wasn't like nobody was telling me, hey, you know, hate your dad or he's evil. It was that any little bad thing that would happen to any, any setback with me and my mom and my sisters, I felt powerless. I was frustrated. And somehow the enemy whispered into my heart, right? Hey, this is because your dad. And so what happened? I created that resentment, created that resentment. Uh, I kept on trying to do the right thing uh, and stuff like that. Things were working out. I, I'm going to tell you right now, and um, I love my mom. My mom was an incredible lady. You know, she is. She's still she lives in Florida. But my mom, in spite of what, went through at least eight to nine men. That, that, you know, so I remember it was six months later, I had a new stepdad. Uh, two months after that, they broke up, and another stepdad. That's another thing that I was really resentful about because every time, every, every time I would blink and open an eye, there was a new man in our lives. Supposedly the right one. And so that, that too was another thing and that too was something that the enemy put in my heart to go against my father. And it got to the point that I, I even contemplated at one time to murder my dad. It was that serious. I was a young man thinking if I ever get a chance, I'm gonna kill my dad. Because we're going through all this right here, we're suffering for this because he abandoned us and, and, and in spite of whatever was going on with domestic violence, at, at least we had some, some, some little uh, morsels of peace and, and, and stability, and we were dressing a little better, and, and we were together, and at least other families won't make fun of us because we was incomplete over the black sheep of the family. You know, and that was the mentality that, that, that as a child, you know, that I was going through and stuff like that. And, and you know, and again, the enemy is so subtle, you know, and, and, and very subtle. So one incident that really broke me was when my sister I was on, um, my sister was 14 years old, 16. Um, she went on a date with this older man, he was 27 years old. My mom tells me, hey, you know, this this guy here that um, he wants to be a friend with your sister. So I said, all right, bring him home. Let's, let's see what he's about. So what happens? It turns out this guy's 20, 27, 28 years old. Immediately I said, man, I don't, I don't, I don't see the, the connection there. What is a 28-year-old doing with a 14-year-old? What type of friendship is that, right? Very funny for me, right? And, um, but my mom said, hey, you know, let them, let them go out. They just don't go on one date. And, and after that date, it's fine. I just don't want them sneaking around, right? So what ended up happening, they went on a date, and my sister during that date uh, was day break. She was day break. She was in the process of that. She was pregnant. During the pregnancy, she was engaged. This is, the, this is the level of manipulation that that older guy was uh, doing to my sister. And I remember finally after a couple of months we found, I went to the house, it was a big, big mess, big mess. You know, it was a hothead, um, fights, it, it got crazy, cops got involved. 
And so what happened there was that, that one incident of date rape with my sister, what it did to me, I started, I, it just broke something in me to the point that I said as a child. Again, I wasn't speaking to nobody. I wouldn't speak to nobody. I would go to school, I would look normal, I would go to church and look normal. Because you know, another thing in my mom would practice is that when the cops would come in when she was getting assaulted or, 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 or hurt, and she would say, hey, don't talk about it. This is a family matter. Then again, I wouldn't talk about it. Like I said before, there's so many opinions. And, and look, the family of faith, you know, we, we have the Holy Spirit, right, amen? You know, we're called to be peacemakers. We're called to, to bring a word of grace and do season, right, in the situation. The worst thing that can happen in a situation or, or whatever, the, the, any dispute with a brother in the church, whether it's in a marriage or whatever, is to give di divergent opinions. Because it does more harm, right? It does more harm than anything else. But what that did to me was my sister getting David and everything, and me uh, feeling powerless, and me feeling disrespected, and then again, this was another strike against my dad, is that I said, you cannot be good. There's nothing good. There's nothing good in this planet. Nobody's good. Nobody respects anyone. People are evil. You know, so I'm going to dedicate myself to doing evil. I'm going to dedicate myself to destroy people. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to lash out. I'm going to lash out with every, every ounce I have against society, against whoever. And then in that result, I decided if I ever see my father, I am going to take his life. Because this is the last straw. So again, if you were seeing me in the Bronx, normal kid, play baseball, everything, it didn't matter, you know, you wouldn't notice, you know. I, I believe that the people of God then, but then at that one that time, that's when I was the believe, um, there's a church called John 316 that was reaching out to my mom. My mom got saved first, and praise God for that. Um, my, my little sister Monica, the one that, um, that they got David, she gets saved after my mom. And I remember another thing, uh, conflict in my heart was, you know, and in the conflict I had my mom was like, hey, how do you betray what you gave me as a kid? You know, you go to this Christianity thing, you go to Jesus. But meanwhile, we was practicing spiritism, we was practicing this Afro-Cuban religion coming from Nigeria and this stuff, but yet you decide to accept this God in Christ. Another big line that, that, that Satan had me under was that I thought that when you follow Christianity, I thought it was a white man's religion, right? Big lie, right? I thought that European powers came and they used the Bible, they, Jesus Christ told them to destroy our cultures and all this and stuff. Uh, big satanic lie, we know that, that that wasn't the case, you know. Um, and, and praise God for his truth and his word, right? And so, so all this is, is going in my head. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I, mean, I had already made pact with demonic forces to, to bring my dad to come visit so I could do what I had to do with him. Um, and I gave my, whole, my heart wholeheartedly to the streets. And this, I ran the streets for a couple of years. Um, did I make money? Not the million dollars that I was looking for, because I was looking to make a lot of money just get my family out as a desperate gambit or as a move to get out of the Bronx. Um, what ended up happening was that in one such running in the streets, um, I was running with a group of guys, young men, the same thing. Uh, they, they probably had similar stories in that they were all so broken, they was all running the streets, they was always angry, and, and they was just, just, just really rebellious. And we ended up getting in a situation where eventually I ended up taking a young man's life. I ended up taking a young, young man's life, and from there I'm going to say this about, and this is what I mean about the, the murder, right? About murder, and how Hollywood and rappers and stuff like that they they, they, they twist that into something good. You know, the Bible says that that in the end times they'll call good that was good bad and was bad good, right? And what happened is the minute. I participated, I committed that murder. Let's call it what it is. I felt, I felt at that point, there was no turning back. I felt there was a curse upon me. I felt that somehow, somewhere, God, right? The God that I didn't know, right? Remember, I had all these concepts of God. I was practicing two or three different things. I felt that this is it. You're sealed, you're done. You know, you're, 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 you're done. And I got worse. And the drug uses got worse. And, and, and the violence got worse, you know. And, and let me tell you something about, about people that commit murder. You might think they're in charge of anything, not. It's like when Cain, when Cain killed, killed Abel, what was the first thing he told God? He said, hey, I'm afraid. I, if, if wherever I go, you put a mark on me, it's going to kill me. You know, I'm paraphrasing, it's going to kill me. I, I felt that. I felt that. The paranoia, the anger, again, bitterness. I took what I did against my dad. I said, I did this because my dad wasn't there. Again, the enemy was putting in my heart, right? 
put it in my heart to hate and to try to murder my dad and to go against society and to go against anything that is good, right? You know, and justifying it because something happened to my sister. You know, and, and so what happened? I ended up on the streets. I ran for 10 days, and in 10 days, I got caught by the detectives. I'm going to tell you, when I got arrested, it was pretty the, the best thing that happened to me. I'm not against cops. I say that. Some people don't like it. I'm not against the, the officers. I believe in Romans 13. It says that they're there placed by God. I believe that wholeheartedly. I teach that. When I see officers, I talk to them. In my profession, I'm a social worker. Long Island, I tell them that. I tell them, listen, I'm praying for you. I, I know that Romans 13 need that. Because you are a servant of God, right? And, and, and we need that. We need our troops and all that. You know, I, really, I wholeheartedly believe in that. And so I got arrested. And in prison, you figure, and I think the uh, pastor, you said it, the correctional facility don't fix nothing. I ended up in Rikers Island. Rikers Island, in, in my times, uh, it was 1993, because I don't know if it changed for the better. I don't know, uh, I've been looking at the news lately. I don't know if it did change. I don't know. <laughs> the brother's laughing, so it probably did, right? I entered Rikers Island. I was, um, again, drug, drug addicted. I was still practicing the, the, the cult, I, the bitterness and all that. Rikers Island at that time had a total of 11,000 or 14,000 detainees at any given time, right? You have a force of 9,000 correctional officers. I think 1,000 is a category of um, sergeant lieutenants and stuff with one commission. That was the right thing on back then. Um, I don't know now. I guess it did. It got worse, right? It probably got worse. And I remember going there, and again, I'm operating under a huge guilt. The guilt that I had in prison was, 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 was so, it, it was so terrible that I wanted to take my life. But I was a coward. This is the funny thing about those that run the street of thugs and all that stuff. You, you want to kill, but when it's your turn, you don't want to die, right? right? And I remember, I'm running around, I'm fighting. I'm fighting uh, blood gang members. The Lion Kings were big back then. The Neanderthal gangs were like super big back then too. And, and uh, a war, there was like a civil war in the prisons. And even police, uh, correctional officers got caught up with that war because it, it was, um, they felt there was a racial thing against the Latin gangs versus the black gangs and all this other stuff. But I remember getting in the fray of the whole thing with the host that one of those gang members would kill me. So when somebody would talk about Louis, they'll say, hey, oh, this guy, he got a harm. This guy's a fighter, man. Look at him. He's jumping in front of the, the riot squad. He just got beat up, sent to the hospital again, right? But it did. It built a reputation, right? But it, it didn't accomplish the fact that I wanted to die because I felt, I felt that guilt. I felt that there was you know, no forgiveness for what I did. Um, I couldn't sleep at night. There was nothing taken. I was taking drugs. I jumped from um, taking pills to dropping acid to, to uh, um, snorting heroin, which I never did in the street, but in prison, I was trying to take the pain into fights. After every fight, I feel a little better, but guess what? The guilt was still there, and then I felt, you know what? This is going to be my life. I'm going to die in here. This is it. There, there is nothing. There is nothing. Um, you know what, I should probably backtrack something I had to say. Um, um, please forgive me. Got to add myself. But I want to say this real quick. Um, before getting locked up, okay, my mom and my sister, got, got, they got saved in this church called John 316 in the Bronx, right? On Westchester Avenue. Um, I believe the, the pastor was Theophilo Vargas. That was his name. Um, I think he passed and went to heaven with the Lord, right? And um, I remember that when I went there, this is something for, for, for the church. This is something I like to give to you guys, the call out walk like the pastor said. Because there's power in the church. There's power in the gospel. And there's no reason to be afraid of witchcraft or anything that, that, that spiritual that, that you think is harmful. At all. At all. Just the name of Jesus, right? Just a prayer. Just lifting up hands. You can put in worship music because the Bible says that when, when, the, when the, the God inhabits the praises of his people. Right? So, and I'm saying this from a point when I went to that church, I went to shut my mother's mouth. I said, you know what? I'm going to go one time. I'm going to go there and um, let it be the end of this argument. I don't want to argue with my mother. And I went to church. And I remember I'm going to church, and I felt the love of God. I, I finally felt, for the first time, Pastor, the love of God, the love of Jesus. Right? But I did something in the Bible, so I found out years later when I got saved. I thought, I'm reading all this, what I did in John 3, 16. I heard it in my heart. And I remember as they were worshiping and preaching and all that, um, I felt, and they did the altar, I felt the love of God. And you know what I did? I sat in the pew and I started summoning demonic forces in the church. I started cursing the blasphemy that I was talking about, blaspheming Jesus and, and the pastors and, and dropping F-bombs in church. Now this, this is important, you know, I'm gonna tell you this. 
This is when we congregate, it's important to be vigilant, right? And when you take, you know, coming to church service because you know who's coming through that door. And I was sitting there, and, and, and I thought I was a good looking kid back then. I, I thought I had a flat top and all this, right? A little jacket, right? I don't know. I, I mean, back, I don't know who those uh, young, I don't even know what a flat top is, right? It's probably a bad idea now, right? Um, but I sat there, and if you would look at me, I had a big smile. And um, you, hey, God bless, hey, God bless you too. And I, and I, I would play that, 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 I would just go with the flow. You know, like they said, you go to Rome, you know, like, like the Romans. And I remember I just kept, I was getting so bitter and angry because I'm feeling this level, this, this living God who I thought well, was a God to destroy our culture and all this, this, this satanic life. And, um, and I remember summoning, and I started summoning images of the abuse my dad and mom was going through domestic violence. I started the images of my sister getting uh, 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 raped. And I started summoning all anything wicked in my heart. Now I'm summoning, but you know it's the enemy right behind it, but you no know, fueling me. He's egging me on. And, I, and, and what I did, I, I cursed God, and I cursed, and I cursed, and I cursed. And then when the service was over, as I was walking out the door, the pastor, he said, listen, I'm not, I'm not just scaring people into heaven. I'm not going to, I don't do that. And the guy said, I've been here like 30 years. I don't do that. He said, but what I am going to say is this. I feel that this message is also, of course, for somebody specifically. If you step out those doors, something worse will happen to you. And I knew he was talking to me. Because there's no way I was sitting there in a church which I thought had no power whatsoever and with all the demonic forces that I had supposedly backing me up, I was going to get touched with the love of God. And so I walked out and then eventually what happened happened. I ended up in Rikers Island. I, 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 it was messed up. Um, so now I spent about three and a half years in Rikers Island and during that stay there, um, you, know, you know, God has his people everywhere. Right? Um, I remember a correction uh, counselor, uh, it was a counselor, a correction captain in town, he was Christian. Um, I remember this guy named Tony Land King Tony that, uh, what really spoke to me was he went to the yard. And, and as he's going out, he's telling me, hey, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit the Land of Kings. And I'm saying to myself, good luck, <laughs> you know, because you, you can't get out. You can't, the, the way you get out, they kill you or they stab you or they put an X, an X on your chest. That's how the Land King used to go back then. I don't know about now. And I remember he said something about, he was carrying a Bible. And I said, yo, what's with this Bible thing, brother? What's going on, man? He goes, he says, Lou, you know, I spoke to a guy yesterday, right? And he told me that um, he got me, that, that I'm going to be able to walk out from this gang life. I want to know I serve Jesus. You know, I, I, I got a confidence in God. So I said, you know what? Okay, that's good. So I'm going to go out with you. My man, your bone, this, this, this guy, Puerto Rican guy, you're a tough guy. I love your bone, but you're stronger and more wicked than me. And I feel safe with him, right? <laughs> So as bad as I was, right? And, and I remember we're going out, and, 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 and this is what's powerful about God's people, man. He, he sat in a circle with 30 land kings. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting. He's talking, talking. He's opening the When he opened the Bible, I said, nah, isn't that only in church? There's another pastor, somebody, you know, a evangelist priest opens the Bible in church. He opened the Bible, ministered to them, and they all started crying. They started hugging them. And, uh, and they let them go. He invited me to church for the first time in prison. He invites me to church, right? A, a Pentecostal service that was coming in uh, from out of the Bronx. And, and surprisingly to me, I said, I'll go with you. But I was already being touched by God. You know, God was using his people in the correctional facility to touch me. I didn't get saved from that. I went to the service. Uh, this guy from the piano came. He prayed over me. started speaking in tongues and all that. I felt something, but I still rejected it. Two, three, uh, two years later after that experience, you know, that was in the Beacon building, that was in um, NIC, I think I was, I forgot what there's so many buildings in Rikers Island, it's a city. I didn't accept the Lord, but I got worse, 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 and worse, and then the time came, finally the time came for sentences, and finally the, the time came where I had to face that music, right? I kept on um, telling my Lord I was innocent, I didn't do it, this is a conspiracy, uh, the white people in power, and I don't listen to my white brothers, I love you all. <laughs> I can't win this case in trial. I can't assume so much evidence. 
um, your friends, everybody you know they, 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 you're done. But if you take 15, I'm sure that you could do, you're a young man, you're strong, you can go up there, do programs and stuff. Mind you, my first time in prison, I don't know what the heck he was talking about. Talking about rehab and this and that. So I go to court, I go to court, I went to one court, and um, finally they did tell you you have to confess everything you go on the record. Make sure that you, you're your free will. So I did that. When I come back, um, I go for the day of sentencing. I remember um, this guy, it was in November, November 1995. Right, so that was the, 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 also the day that I was born again. Um, so I go, and I'm, I'm before the judge, I'm looking at the families of, of, of the victim. And um, I remember, and I tell the lawyer, I look back, and I said, no, listen, I don't want to say nothing, I'm good. You say it for me, you say I'm sorry. So when they, they're speaking, they get a chance on the, it, it was horrible because one person read the, the Our Father. And they said, I hope you rot in hell. Uh -oh. That didn't help. That didn't help. I was like, wow, you know, I really don't want to talk to these people. And they kept out, one person cursed me and all that. And listen, I want to say this about the pain of losing somebody. I, I'm going to tell you why I didn't, I didn't hear nothing against that person that said that. Even if they used the Bible because murder is a, is a horrible thing. If I still a car, I can get that back. But when, you, when, when somebody killed, and I speak this to the youth, I speak this in correctional facility, wherever I go, I'm invited. I tell them, murder is something that you break and you can't fix. So I, I had to read my mind, welcome the insults. Because it's coming from a place of pain. It's coming from a place that if I had not done what I've done, that person, we probably would have met in a different circle, I would have been friends, right? And so I, I, to this day, I, 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 just, I just pray for them, and, and I ask that someday they can find forgiveness. You know, and not find forgiveness, find Jesus, right? Amen. So we can fellowship in heaven when that time comes, amen? amen? And so what happened was, out of the whole thing, I'm hearing all these people, and there was this one young lady, um, Ms. Sanchez. And she says, um, he says, I just want Mr. Romero to, to be honest and, and let me know what was the last words, you know, that my, my, my family member said. And when she's speaking, something in me is moving in my heart. I'm like, wow, you know, this is different. And she says, um, so I turn around, I tell the lawyer, I want to speak, he lets me speak, and, and, and I spoke to the lady, I apologized. No, I didn't apologize, what I said was, this is what happened, this is how it happened, it was nothing really, you know, it wasn't even my problem, but I was the cause of your family member's death, and, and uh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I refuse to apologize in the sense that that would be an insult to you. It's not like I get to apologize and make restitution and bring your family member back, that's what I said. I turned around and to my surprise, this lady said something that to this day, it just, it penetrates. She says, Mr. Romero, um, Your Honor, I'm gonna accept his apology, I know he wasn't apologize, but I'm gonna accept what he said, and I forgive him. When she said that, that was the one, I believe, hammer or jackhammer or that made sense to me in that court, it broke me, it hit my heart hard. If you would, again, if you look at me, I was trying to stand there, you know, you know, military tough, I guess, right? Whatever that means. <laughs> and I remember when she said that, and I finally, they, they, they wrapped everything up. I'm going back to Rikers Island now to myself. I was in a, a building called The Beacon. I go in, and what kept on coming to my heart, I forgive him. I forgive him. I forgive him. I forgive him. Now I'm confused. I'm like, wow, why did she do that? Now I'm feeling more guilty because she forgave me. So now I'm, I'm conflicted. I'm like, well, you know, the, the, what? This is it, and, and I still feel that God is not there. You know, I, I don't know which God, but the guys that I served abandoned me. That's facts. The guys that I served just abandoned me. So I end up, I'm in a cell, I go in. I'm in by the way, I'm in solitary confinement because I was, I was a very violent guy. And again, I was trying to die through violence, right? I go in my cell, and I remember that my mom somehow gave me a, a, a book of Psalms and stuff like that. And I remember reading, I think it was Psalm 35, I didn't even write it down, Pastor, but it was a song that said, this poor man cried out and God heard him. I think it was Psalm 34 around there, I'm not sure. So I remember, um, I'm sitting in the cell, and I'm going back to my life, I'm saying, how did I go from being a young kid, innocent kid, uh, who believed in Santa Claus and believed in fairy tales and believed in the tooth fairy when I stuck to murder, facing 15 years of life, I'm sitting in the cell disrespecting my grandfather's teaching because my grandfather was a great guy. He raised, he raised about 10 kids for my grandmother, you know, and did it successfully, you know, did it successfully. So the guilt was there on that. I, I was like, well, I disrespected my mom, the community, because the, the, the funny thing is the community I was with, I, I never did dirt there. So when I got out there, they wrote a petition saying, oh, this guy's innocent. And I felt guilty because I lied to all of them and I let them down. 
And I remember I opened up and opened up to that and I started reading. All of a sudden, I'm seeing, all of a sudden, I started crying and I'm seeing the faces and the voices of every Christian that ever told me that Jesus is the way. I'm sitting there boxing on the words. I don't like boxing, by the way. <laughs> I don't. But I'm sitting, I was, I was in jail cell and I'm, and I'm reading. I started crying and I'm seeing these faces of every Christian. And they kept on saying in my head, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. And I believe this. I believe if I had I not took heed to that, I would have probably did commit suicide, right? And once I, I said that, I looked up. And, and again, there was, no, there was nobody there leading the sinner's prayer or anything. Nobody was able to do none of that. But I remember saying, God, a man can't fight with you forever and live and, and, and win. I remember saying that. As soon as I said that, I looked at my hand. There was blood in my hand. I looked like I had a gash in both my hands. And I felt when the Holy Spirit, back then I didn't understand what happened to me, but I felt when the Holy Spirit sealed me, right? And I felt the speech, and I began reading the Bible since that point on. And then I remember just the peace and everything, and, 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 and I continued persevering. And I remember also that I was reading also, I, I had these, um, and let me tell you, I, I don't like jewelry. So, so when my birthday comes, don't buy me jewelry. <laughs> I don't like it. I, just, I, I wear what I wear because it's a gift, and, and I'm married. Of course, I have to wear this <laughs> But I remember I had this gold chain. I had uh, St. Nazareth and Santa Barbara, you know. And in prison, let me explain to you what that's about. In prison, the bigger the jewelry you wear, it just says you're tough like that. I think it's ignorance, but fine. That's just what it's like a status thing. It's a status. Same thing, though, if you see a guy with a big chin in the front, walking the streets with a little bebop, that's just about ego. That's about sending the message saying, hey, I'm tough like that. And, and, and I can hold it down, as they say, right? And so, so another thing, for you brothers, my sisters, man, very important. This is very important to take it with you. Um, the church is relevant, and you're relevant. You're relevant. You know, um, if it wasn't for, for brothers and sisters, having the courage, the, the time that I was beset, I went in the streets that I was, I was, I was found out and everything, telling me about Jesus, I wouldn't be standing here today. Don't think that you're powerless to you're not. I mean, you know, we are without Christ, but when we preach and give Christ in order for our weaknesses, we are strong. That's what Paul teaches. You know, I'm big on this. I, I, I tell you, I'm big on this. Um, again, I, a, a man that practiced witchcraft, a man that practiced spiritualism, a man that did witchcraft to the church, I'm telling you, there is no power against the church. Amen. There isn't. And, and let me tell you another thing with, 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 with families, you know, fathers, man, you know, you, you are relevant for your family. You are important. Uh, mothers, you know, uh, children, you guys, you know, you, 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 you know, you're divine from God. The Bible says that children is, is a gift from God. You know, and, and so, so, in, in reviewing my life, my testimony, reviewing all that happened to me, I realized that behind all, 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 all the enemy who's trying to, who's coming against family, that's what he does, right? That's what he does. And I'm, so I'm going to say this, so you're probably wondering about my dad, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this know. You're probably wondering what happened to my dad. What do you think happened to my dad? Not yet, but he's still around, right? So, so just, I might not just know, Pat, I'm almost telling my guy left. Where, where's Wayne? Where was? Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. This is what happened. So, so in the church I'm in, a small church, my, my greatest joy, my greatest joy is to work with kids. I work with kids in the church. Um, the ages vary. You know, sometimes I babysit a lot in church, right? So people don't got faith with the kids. And in, in my job, I work for strong youth. I work with, with um, um, in Long Island, Brentwood. I work with uh, um, you know uh, kids that are raised, gang involved, um, girls that are being trafficked, um, families that have been displaced, and everything. That's my job. I love doing it because I'm, I'm, I'm out to rescue families in the name of Christ. That's that's how I see. It. That's my mission. And thank you, man. Good job. So. As God would have it, you know, you can't live the Christian life and not practice what it says, let alone teach. And so we're going to a Bible study. I know my wife, my wife remembers because she was the one that uh, she God used to convict me, right? So I'm going to I'm going to a church that uh, I'm going to teach a class about love and forgiveness and, and, and you know and tolerance, right? And uh, I remember I get a text message from my dad, which I haven't heard in a couple of years. He only came one time when I was in prison. And when I got the text message, he says, he says, Hey, hey, Lucito. So he would call me, hey Lucito, and um, I want to talk to you the way you could call me. Um, your sister in Germany, because you know, I have a sister in Germany, um, and she tried to commit suicide. She, she had a miscarriage and never recovered from that. Um, she's doing well now. Um, but you know, God uses things. 
God uses tragedy sometimes and bad things to, to bring forth his will, amen? And, and, and like it said in Romans 8, 20, what, 8, 28, right? Yeah. And um, I remember when I'm driving, I stopped the car and I'm getting angry, right, my I was very angry. I'm like, I'm like, why is this dude popping up now? I'm good. I'm a Bible study teacher. <laughs> I'm giving my testimony. I'm good. I haven't heard this guy for four years. I'm even better good, right? More than good, right? I'm great, right? But then, this is where, where, where the rubber meets the road. This is where, where, where as people of God, if God forgives us, Amen. why we can't forgive, right. why we can't love, right? And, and another thing I want to say, too, um, I had a problem with the word love. You know, my grandma was big on love and forgiveness, love, 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 and I had a problem with that and what was happening in our lives. You talk about love, it didn't make no sense to me. Love, like, look what we're going through. You know, um, I even had an incident in Puerto Rico where I got molested. You know, walk right up to I never talked about it until I went to prison and therapy in the church, and I was able to open up about getting molested in Puerto Rico. Um, it went on for about an hour. It was hard, it was scary. And all that, too, caused me to get bitter against everyone. And, and so the, the class was I'm going to teach a class. I'm, I'm like 15 minutes away. My dad is, is, is reaching out to me because my sister's suicidal. And I struggled, and I got mad. I ain't gonna lie, I got mad, I probably cursed. I, I like to be transparent with you, my brother and sister. I don't wanna be pretending that they're dead. No, I, I got, you know, Puerto Rican man. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna be honest, I, I, I got Puerto Rican upset. And, uh, and I'm cursing my wife, she's looking at me like, like I got three heads, and she, she, she said, honey, um, you know, we're Christians. So what are you gonna do with that? And, and, and she goes, I'm big on this, I don't have to teach, I'm, you know, I'm practicing, I'm teaching. And, and so I, I made a prayer. Um, it was the most painful prayer <laughs> at that time. And I said, you know, Lord, I, that, that, in spite of everything, he's my dad. And I never used to call him dad. I used to call him that man or that guy or by his last name. And, 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 and I, made, I, I made peace with it right then in the car. I said, Lord, you know, I'm going to engage this guy. I'm going to love on him. And that's what happened. When I went to church, the message that was preaching, right, which is about love and forgiveness, right, and, and the points of forgiveness, you're not forgiven. I'm talking to my kids, and, and I'm saying, hey, what did you read last week? They said, oh, you must forgive at all costs. <laughs> and I guess, like, you know, and, and, you know little kids, they, they're like little girls, boys, they're like from, from the ages of what, four, from four to like nine, right? And I'm looking at them, I'm like, wow, Lord, you got a sense of humor. And uh, what a way to confirm, yeah, sense of humor, I said, so what a way to confirm, and then so... So in spite of the fact that I got saved, I still had issues. Roots of bitterness, I still had hatred to the man that gave me life. You know, and God made me understand, you know, he made me understand, it, it, it doesn't matter, you know, you forgive. You know, and guess what, me and my dad's been friends for two years. Um, I love my missile, he lives in Virginia. Um, he's a great guy, and, and, and I know he's, he's seeking God. And that's where it's at with my dad. I know last time I had Pastor, right? Pastor, uh, in fact, Pastor asked me, no, what happened to your dad? He left him out the testimony. But no, listen, I love my dad. I understand that the, the, the enemy is, is the enemy of families, the enemy of the church. He's behind it. That's why that's why the forgiveness actually must have it has to be only because we don't know what's going on in, in, behind the scenes. We don't know. And listen, I love you guys. Um, I love this church. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. And um, I just pray that I've just really lifted up the name of Jesus here this Amen. afternoon. And uh, hopefully we'll come back for that picnic. I would like to definitely, if you guys invite, come. And I'll bring my son, Stephen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen.